Good afternoon, everyone. We'll give it two more minutes to allow people to join. Sarah Bajaya. Yes. Um, one thing. One thing I remembered. Um, you'll have to tell me when you want me to go to when you're presenting the slides. You'll have to tell me w uh, when to go to the next one. I mean, I'll probably be able to know, but just because I'm going to have control over that. Okay. Okay. So just say next slide, Colin. Okay. All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our event on ableism and the labor market, why are 48,000 disabled workers managed out of work every year? My name is Christian Schuster. I'm a professor in public management at University College London and academic co-director of the UCF Policy Lab. And it's my pleasure to chair today's joint event with the Association for Disabled Professionals, the UCF Policy Lab, and the UCL School of Public Policy. If you're visually impaired, I'm the person wearing a blue shirt, a suit jacket, uh, and glasses. Today's talk tackles a core challenge in the labor market for disabled workers. The tens of thousands are managed out of work every year, even though the 2010 Equality Act entitles disabled workers to request and receive reasonable adjustments from their employers. Why this management out of the workplace is nonetheless, nonetheless occurring is what our two speakers, Dr. Sarabhajaya Kumar and Dr. Colin Provost, will explore in their talk. Dr. Kumar and Dr. Provost will present for about 25 to, to 30 minutes. And after that, we'll have, uh, we have the good fortune of having discussion comments from Tony Wilson, Institute Director of the Institute for Employment Studies. And then after that, of course, you'll have a chance to ask questions uh, in a Q&A. Now, before they start their talk, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers and our discussant. Dr. Sarabhajai Kumar has been lecturing nonprofit management and leadership uh, at UCL's Department of Political Science since 2010. Uh, she was previously at Oxford and the LSC. Uh, she's an expert on accountability, governance, ethical leadership, intersectionality, and equality. For instance, her recent uh, projects include lived experiences of disabled university experience as students during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, coronavirus intersectionalities of disabled and minoritized groups, and ableism and the labor market, which is of course the subject of tonight's launch. Uh, Dr. Kumar is also a member of the Bar Standards Board Disability Task Force, the Policy Advisory Committee of the Women's Budget Group, a director of Impatience, which hosts innovative public benefits projects, a senior independent trustee of the National Council of Voluntary Organizations, and a steering committee member for the Centenary Action Group. She also contested the 2021 GLA election for the Women's Equality Party as the only disabled candidate. Dr. Provost, our second speaker, is an Associate Professor of Public Policy at UCL and Director of the MSc in Public Policy. He holds a PhD in Political Science from Stony Brook uh, and was previously at, at Oxford before joining uh, UCL. His research focuses on regulation of business and regulatory compliance. Uh, recent projects include the, the very one we're, we'll hear about tonight, uh, but also business compliance with the UK Modern Slavery Act, uh, compliance monitoring and legal settlements, and the effect of revolving doors on regulatory compliance. Dr. Provost is a collaborator with the UCL Global Governance Institute, the UCL Center for US Politics, and a co-convener of ComplianceNet, an organization of scholars devoted to studying the intersection of rules and human behavior. Our expert discussant, Tony Wilson, is Institute Director of the Institute for Employment Studies. As Institute Director, Mr. Wilson leads a team of 40 people delivering research, analysis, and consultancy support on employment skills, education, and HR. 
Uh, Tony is a recognized expert on labor market policy and employment and skills programs, and previously held a number of senior roles at the Learning and Work Institute, the Treasury, and the Department for Work and Pensions, among others. Uh, before we start, uh, please note that there is simultaneous British li Sign Language interpretation of this event, uh, so feel free to pin the British Sign Language interpreter or use the side-by-side -side views when the presentation starts to see the Sign Language interpretation uh, while the slides are up during the presentation. If you have questions for the presenter, you are free already from now to use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask your question, so you can start doing that at any time. Uh, we'll then have a Q&A after the discussant comments in which I'll pull the, pull, put the questions raised to the presenters and the discussant. Uh, and if you're unable to use the Q&A function, for instance, because of visual impairment and would like to ask a question, then of course, in the Q&A, you can also use the raise your hand function in Zoom, and then we'll give you a video access and you can ask your question verbally or in sign language. So without further ado, let me pass the floor to our two presenters, Dr. Kumar and Dr. Provost. Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Um, I just wanted to say a very warm welcome to everybody this evening and thank you so much for coming to our um, launch of our report on ableism in the labour market. We also want to acknowledge uh, the role that a DDPO, um, the Association of Disabled Professionals has played in this important research. They've not only funded us, but the chair, Jane Hunt, um, has been a, a stellar support for us throughout the, uh, the, the project. So we want to absolutely acknowledge their important contribution to this work and, and thank them very much. Um, with this, uh, I, I was just going to say that the, the way that we're going to do the presentation is that Colin and I will take turns. Um, um, so we will go back and forth between us a little bit because this is very much a, a, a joint endeavor. Um, so with this, I will hand over to Colin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Vijaya. And um, I assume everybody can see the presentation because nobody has piped up otherwise, but obviously if there are any issues, please do um, say something. Um, the main subject of our, of our report and what we'll be talking about is the problem of employment um, among the disabled working population. So in the UK, 22% of the working population is disabled, but the employment gap between the non-disabled people and disabled people is 30%. So the unemployment rate for disabled workers is considerably higher um, than it is for non-disabled workers. And every year, um, the, the all-party parliamentary group on disability estimates that about 48,000 disabled people are managed out of work. And the number is, is a number of our interviews, interviewees informed us quite possibly higher than that, considerably higher than that. So what does it mean to be managed out of work, right? Like when you hear that expression, you, you probably have some inkling of what that means, but you, it, it's hard to figure out exactly what it means. Well, as many of you will know, the disabled workers require adjustments in the workplace, right? And, and these could be a, a wide variety of, of adjustments. So um, some of them might need physical access to a building, right? But sometimes, most of the time, it's, it's far less complicated than that. It might be a matter of altering the lighting in a room. It might be a requirement for certain software, um, requirement of a certain chair. And, you know, there's, there's a number of different adjustments it could be. So these, these are, are things that are often needed by disabled workers. Now, they, the Equality Act, as we'll see in a second, gives workers the right to request these adjustments. But sometimes, often, adjustments are delayed, right, or, or don't come for, for a variety of reasons. And when, they, when they, workers don't have their adjustments, it's difficult for them to work as effectively as if they were in place. And of course, when they don't have their reasonable adjustments, the perception of performance suffers. It, it could be that the actual performance suffers as well because they don't have those adjust, adjustments. But the perception of performance suffers. Workers might end up taking sick leave. They might be gone for a while. Um, this might cause the line manager or the employer to say, you're not doing your job properly, um, which leads to further acrimony about the presence of or the absence of reasonable adjustments. And the employer at some point might feel justified by the perceived poor performance in terminating the employment. So this is one example, but this is a, a frequent example of, of what it is to be managed out, what it is for a disabled worker to, to be managed out of the workplace. 
So as I briefly mentioned, the, the 2010 Equality Act gives disabled workers the right to request reasonable adjustments for their work so that they have the right to go up and, and ask for these particular adjustments so that they can do, do their job better or do their job appropriately and level the playing field. Um, if they don't get them, right, or if they experience managing out, as we just talked about, they can bring a claim before an employment tribunal um, if they don't have their reasonable adjustments, if they're not granted, or if they or if they lose their job, okay? Um, and this is the primary avenue of, of recourse, right? Their recourse is judicial. Um, there's, there's no reasonable adjustment regulator that inspects the workplaces. Um, there, as, as we'll talk about, there are some voluntary programs that businesses can join, organizations can join in order to show that they're trying to, um, that they're trying to offer reasonable adjustments so that they're doing a good job at this. And we'll, we'll go into that in some detail. Um, but there's not really a, there's not really a, a regulation per se, right? It's primarily just a, a judicial remedy. Um, so the Equality Act was supposed to be you know, not, not necessarily the panacea, but it was supposed to help considerably in leveling the playing field for disabled workers. Um, but given the evidence that we've already discussed, the managing out evidence, um, the Equality Act does appear to be letting us down. So in this report, we've tried to investigate that more and ask, um, why is it letting down disabled workers and how, in what specific ways? And that's what we've explored in, in quite a bit of detail. So, I'll just talk a little bit about my interest in, in this project and how it came about. Um, and then Sarah Bajaya will, will continue talking about her own interests and she'll, she'll take it from there um, for, for part of the presentation. Um, I, I, was in, I became interested in this project because I had talked to Sarah Bajaya about some of her own experiences. Um, and, and the more we talked, the more I became interested in the Equality Act. And I thought, well, you know, in, in the difference between what's on paper and, and what happens in reality. And for a while now, much of my research has focused on, focused on regulatory compliance. And so I think that one of the most interesting things you, you can study is um, you might have a regulation on paper, but then the really important question is, are all the relevant actors complying with it? And how do they understand compliance? Is it, is, it, is it understood the same way as the people who designed the bill and those who are implementing it understanding it as well? And it was obvious after talking with Sarah and doing a little bit of research that there, there are some issues with um, business and organizational compliance with the Equality Act. So uh, the more we talked, the more interested I became and we decided to do this research together and I'm, I'm very glad that we did. And on that note, I will hand it back to her. Thank you, Colin. Um, and as Colin has said, um, this research partly comes out of both of our intellectual interests, Colin's in compliance, mine in accountability, um, but more strongly in, in my situation from my lived experience. And my lived experience of uh, was that I was managed out of a role that I was both, that I enjoyed, I was good at, um, and I found it quite shocking and it happened when my invisible impairments became visible. Um, and so for me, I wanted to understand whether my situation uh, with that particular employer was unique or, it, or not. And uh, as a result of sort of initial research, I found that it was far from exceptional. And as Colin has already stated, um, the APPG's work uh, that, where they commissioned uh, several professors uh, one of which was Kim Hock, um, to look at this issue. They estimated that around 48,000 uh, disabled people per year are managed out of, of their workplace. Um, and that was pre-pandemic. And during the course of our research, many of our expert respondents actually challenged that figure and said that it was likely far higher, uh, which was extraordinary um, to me. So really, I wanted, and, and with Colin, with his expertise, to explore that given that the legislation is in place um, to protect people uh, with, with protected characteristics, disabled workers, why is it um, that this is, this is happening uh, today? So that, that was what informed our interest in the research. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the um, key findings uh, we, we found was that organisational culture is critical um, in, in this process. 
So there are drivers for inclusion for disabled people um, and there are barriers to inclusion. Um, and these include compliance, so very much Colin's area, but fear of litigation versus a sort of strong business case for inclusion, higher productivity, retention of creative and valuable employees and harmonious working relationships. So there was this tension between legal compliance, fear and organisations that actually valued disabled people. The barriers to inclusion we found included what some of our respondents uh, called a failure of imagination. There was also a lack of personal experience. Um, so people, apparently two thirds of the public fear uh, talking to a disabled person. They fear offending them, they fear talking to them. Um, so there's a lack of personal experience. And what one of our respondents called disability apartheid, where disabled and non-disabled people uh, don't talk really uh, about disability because there's, well, there's a defensiveness, a fear of wrongdoing, um, particularly by line managers and employers. The other issue that came up quite often was the perceived costs of reasonable adjustments, the issues of health and safety, and the futility of individual action um, without, with, and paper policies without leadership and uh, absolutely implemented policies in organisations. The other issue was general attitudes and assumptions about disability and uh, prejudice, basically. One of our respondents um, called this chair envy. And, and you know, if, if a disabled person for musculoskeletal reasons needed a particular type of chair, um, there were concerns by their line managers about, well, if you want that, everybody will want that, and that will impact on team, uh, team morale. And there were issues of favouritism. If we give you reasonable adjustments, that will be discriminatory and unfair on disabled, on non-disabled people. I'm not sure, uh, Colin, if I've got to the end of that, I'm afraid I can't see, but I'll, I'll leave you to... <laughs> to check okay you, you there was bullying and harassment um yeah. was, if you want to say that yeah yeah so obviously then the next one the next key issue and it was a, a big issue was bullying and harassment and i guess it won't be a surprise to many of you here that disabled people are subject to more bullying and harassment from line managers but also sometimes co-workers the non-disabled colleagues and this is often comes out in staff surveys in, in many organisations. Um, so that's in a way not a surprise. And such discriminatory behaviour may be direct or it may be more subtle, although intentional. For example, being singled out for criticism, being micromanaged, the subject of derogatory comments, patronised, ignored, harassed while on sick leave, mocked for their disability, expected to perform unreasonable tasks and excluded from social work events it can be used as a deliberate strategy for managing people out and i have a quote here which was from one of our, one of our respondents bullying from line managers definitely unfortunately something we've seen fairly regularly i did have someone who had managed to get hold of internal emails from his company and some of the things they were saying about him the line manager to his colleagues was really shocking and then there was another case with people making quite derogatory comments to the individual it does tend to be in my experience the line manager making these kind of comments about people's disability and some of it was really really horrible actually the other issue that we came across was to do with human resources and occupational health. And when they work well, they can actually transition and manage people back into the workplace. However, very often, 
they're instrumental in the process of managing people out. And HR professionals often provide advice to line managers, but we found that they lack information, knowledge, and or training about the Equality Act and reasonable adjustments. Another quote, in occupational health, professional training, and certainly in HR professional training, you seem to be able to be qualified without knowing anything at all about making reasonable adjustments, which seem to me to be entirely wrong. The next slide, Colleen, is changing company culture. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, so the next finding we had was around uh, changing company culture and company thinking. So to prioritize disability equality, organizations need to have inclusive policies and importantly, inclusive practices. For instance, reasonable adjustments need to be accommodated when disabled workers request them. And it's also important that line managers listen and show support. And I quote, the impairment is kind of almost irrelevant. It's the barriers that people experience. Your job as a manager is to remove those barriers so they can be the best they can be. And so it's educating people and removing the fear and showing them a different way of looking at the problem that they perceive, hence rooted in the social model. Organisations with best practice have moved away from legal conceptions of reasonable adjustments for disabled workers to workplace adjustments available to all employees, regardless of whether they are disabled or not. Another point. I guess if you have kind of a management culture that assumes every employee, whether they are disabled or not, is going to work in different ways, be helped by different types of things, and just generally kind of find their way slightly differently, and that you want to help them to do that, then adjustments break down barriers associated with disability or just one part of the general approach. It's kind of going to probably a goal of people succeeding and enjoying their work. Organisations also adopted the social network workers. Part of changing the organisational practices, thought processes and behaviour of employers and line managers, and over time, the culture. For organisations still working with the reasonable adjustments model, the organisations who have centralised the requests for these adjustments have improved the process by taking the decision and the pressure away from managers and disabled workers. I think we're on access to work now, Colin. Is that right? Um, sorry, I had the... Uh... No, we had we had one more about social model, but then I think yeah. So okay, sorry, I think I missed that. Now access to work. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, That's all right. So there's a couple of uh, government schemes. Access to work is one, and many of you would have heard of it. But it's a publicly funded employment support program that aims to help more disabled people start or stay in work. It provides practical and financial support, including specialist equipment, support workers mental health support services and travel to work. Its expenditure in 20, between 2019 and 2020 was 141.7 million pounds. On the one hand, our respondents agreed that the broad purpose of the programme is extremely positive. However, its implementation is not working as well as it could and indeed would benefit from significant improvement as it currently often presents an additional barrier to disabled. Somewhat alarmingly, they actually lose their jobs because of the level of service. Some respondents expressed very strident and critical views. A disgrace, very inefficient, got to be reformed. Criticisms included a lack of awareness about the programme, both employers and disabled people. Some people referred to it as the best kept secret. The other issue is that the onus falls very much on the disabled applicant. So there's a lot of invisible labour and the process can be labyrinthine, complex. And that can also lead to blurred boundaries where there are not there are 
problems that are raised as a, as a result between them and their employer, rather than a tripartite conversation. It was also criticised as having an outdated approach with overly bureaucratic systems and processes, a lack of responsiveness. So if you're a disabled entrepreneur, it's not quite responsive to your needs. Um, a lack of flexibility. So we were told of an example of, uh, of somebody requiring an iPad, somebody who is blind versus um, equipment that Access to Work would agree to fund, which was unfit for their purpose. And the, the equipment that they would agree to fund was three times the cost of the iPad. There's issues around timeliness in relation to grants, several people waiting months and that impacts on work relationships, feelings of powerlessness uh, for the disabled worker and what's their confidence. And finally, there's a cap on funding and that actually causes additional and further disadvantage to those with higher support needs. Colin, the next one, disability confident, thank you. Yep. The next scheme we looked at was the or, or that was raised, sorry, in the interviews was the Disability Confidence Scheme, which was launched in 2013, another government scheme by the Department of Working Pensions, and replaced the Tutic Scheme. A voluntary scheme, its aim was to get more disabled people into employment, reduce the employment gap between the disabled people and non-disabled people, and support employers to make the most of the disabled talent that they had and, and that disabled people could bring to the workplace. The objective is very much to encourage employers to become more confident, increase their understanding of disability and the benefits of employing disabled workers. The scheme has three levels. Level one, committed, what they call committed. Level two, employer and level three, leader. Again, it faced many criticisms and concerns from our respondents. Um, it was referred to as a sort of public relations, PR, marketing tool, uh, a tick box exercise um, and many people suggested that in order to be awarded any of the levels there is very little evidence required as to how the employer makes an impact on disabled people's working lives. On the positive side the scheme provides a good framework for very highly motivated employers. One respondent mentioned that even organisations on level one that were committed to being disability positive employers could use the scheme's guidance to affect change. However, its lack of ambition, monitoring and enforcement and independent oversight mean that it's right unlikely to have its intended impact. In its current form, the scheme is unlikely to either prevent disabled people from being managed out of their roles or to halve the disability employment gap. However, if they could set the expectation that employers should employ all criteria, complete all criteria and activities within the themes associated within each level, if the government could ensure monitoring outcomes and measuring the success through an independent body, it would go some considerable way to strengthening the scheme and addressing current concerns. Next slide. Next slide. Um, finally, we looked at the role of the voluntary non-profit sector. And um, obviously the sector itself employs disabled people and is not actually immune to some of the criticisms that other sectors face. Um, nevertheless, uh, voluntary organisations and deaf and disabled people's organisations play a broader role in interactions with employers and disabled workers. Based on their research, these organisations provide very valuable information, advice, services and support to individual disabled workers and other organisations and employers. They also campaign and advocate on behalf of disabled people and develop bespoke programs to help organisation 
nor cultures become much more disability positive. We particularly heard about specific programs that had helped disabled graduates in particular um, get not only into the labour market, but actually uh, impact on uh, change on their employers. And of these voluntary non-profit organisations and these deaf and disabled people's organisations, many people have expertise, both by experience and by knowledge. Thanks, Colin. Over to you. You're on mute, Colin. Okay. Can everybody still see the presentation? Okay. Thank you. Um, just, okay. Right. So unions were are, are quite important. We we spoke to a number of representatives from unions, um, and they they came up repeatedly. And generally, their role is positive, although not not all the time, but. Um, unions provide extra support to workers, right, um, as, as well as important assistance. So we're, we're all familiar with the, the level of, of enforcement that worker that, that unions will often provide in, for worker rights. Um, but beyond that, in a perhaps more informal role, um, unions provided a lot of information to employees regarding obtaining reasonable adjustments um, and say navigating employment tribunals if, if it ever came to that. Um, but before it comes to that, right, it's not always necessarily obvious how you get reasonable adjustments. Um, the Equality Act says that employees can ask their employer um, about reasonable adjustments, but then sometimes the employer doesn't necessarily have the, the information either. And um, that's that doesn't make the employer a bad person, just means that maybe they're just not familiar with it. They haven't had to do it before. So unions are there to help them as well. Um, so we often think of unions as being kind of part of a, an adversarial process sometimes between employees and employers. But in this case, they could play a, a bit of a bridging role in terms of providing information to both employees and employers um, to help them understand how to get reasonable adjustments and, um, and, and therefore be able to do their job more easily. Some of the really compelling evidence that we learned about unions as well is that um, em employees, disabled employees, were much more likely to self-report their disabilities um, than those without union support. So something that was touched on, we, we talk about in the report as well, is that many disabled employees are, are afraid of what might happen if they, if they disclose their disability, if they ask for reasonable adjustments, um, because, because they're afraid that maybe they will be managed out or, or they'll be given a tough time or, or be told any of the things that, that Sarah Bajaya has already talked about. Um, union supported employees were less likely to have this fear they were more likely to have some more confidence um, go up and disclose their disability and and then ask for reasonable adjustments as well okay um so so there was there was that there was that advantage um to having having unions present um there were some limitations though right there were some some limitations in what unions can do and and some of this doesn't necessarily have to do with things that are their unions are doing wrong necessarily unions are more likely to be present in in larger organizations right for for the bigger employers right in, in employers that probably have hr departments and, and occupational health and have more institutionalized processes for how employees are managed and, and assisted right so Small and medium enterprises are, are often less likely to have um, to, to have union protection, and so with this, uh, you have you have employees who maybe are also more reluctant to disclose their disabilities. And as you get to smaller um, organizations, sometimes you're more likely to see precarious work, right, among these SMEs. And this is where um, unions are also less likely to be. And this is where the situation was often the worst. For disabled workers, right? They, they, the priority of reasonable adjustments just was not there in um, in organizations that ran by zero-hour contracts, right, or that had precarious work, and um, it was something where disabled workers uh, struggled more to be seen in those particular instances. Okay, so you know unions are are more present in some organizations than others, and um, and and the, the work the disabled workers in those organizations benefit. Um, but they also they feel their absence in the smaller and medium enterprises as well. 
We also heard from our interview evidence that um, unions could provide a guide for employment tribunals. They, they could help out. Um, but at the same time, their legal advice was often somewhat limited. And th that's, be that's partly because union officials, if you think about the fact that they already do quite a bit and here maybe they're offering information about reasonable adjustments or offering information about employment tribunals. They're essentially generalist you know, people who are, who are asked to give very specialized advice in a range of different functions. And it's difficult for them to give very specialist legal advice that you would normally expect from a solicitor. So we heard that unions would often advise settling um, when maybe it wasn't the you know, in an employment tribunal case. Although to be fair, we heard that settling was what was advised by most people, by solicitors as well. Um, but uh, but sometimes the the advice that the, the union officials would give would be a little bit limited. And um, the fact that union officials have to step in here and give advice about something like this also tells you a little bit about um, the state of legal advice, right? And how, how it's not always very forthcoming uh, for disabled workers when they need it. So, and that, that moves me into the subject of, of legal recourse, um, which is the, uh, which has to do with what, what disabled workers can do if they've been wronged, if they, if they believe they've been discriminated against in the workplace, if they believe they've been deprived of earnings because they've been unjustly dismissed, right? So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there is no disability regulator or inspector. There's no, um, there's no regulator who goes around making sure that organizations are providing reasonable adjustments or that they are not discriminating against disabled workers. And if we really wanna get into that, um, there, there are a number of ways that organizations can make it appear that they are complying with disability law when really they're not, and they're doing things like, like managing out. And, and sadly, that was something that comes back to disability confidence, we thought as well, was that, that that's not always, um, sometimes it's used as, as marketing, as Sarah Bajaya said. So employment tribunals exist for disabled workers to bring legal action in the event of discrimination by the employer. And it's just this judicial remedy that they have. Um, but of course, in order to go to an employment tribunal, um, you really have to know what you're doing. It's not recommended that somebody go in representing themselves. Uh, it does happen, but it's not generally recommended. It's not seen as the good strategy. So this means, of course, you need legal representation, which inevitably is going to be somewhat expensive. Now, we did talk to lawyers from, from law centers who do pro bono, pro, pro, pro bono work. Um, and these pro bono legal services do exist in and around the UK. But they're 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 not they're not equally distributed throughout the country, right? So there's a um, dare I use the term a little bit of a postcode lottery. I'm sure it's not exactly that, but but they're, they're, in some places you might succeed in getting in getting pro bono legal services, where in other places you might really struggle to find somebody who who can represent you. Now, prior to 2012, it was somewhat. It's hard for me to say to precisely what extent, but it was easier to get legal aid from the government. Um, which would provide you with the ability to get to, to get these legal services, but legal aid um, has been cut back, and so it's been, it's now unavailable basically to all but 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 the most impoverished disabled workers, right? So so the the, the threshold for getting legal aid is quite low. So a lot of people find themselves kind of in the middle, um, where they. They don't make enough money to get good legal representation, but they still make too much money to qualify for legal aid um, or other types of legal services. Right. And the reality of employment tribunals is is probably quite different from what um, what was imagined by those writing the Equality Act. And, you know, and when I say what was imagined originally it was, it was that the but by giving workers the right to go to employment tribunals, there's a sense that here they can enforce their rights. If they think they've been discriminated against, they can bring a case, they can bring their evidence. Um, they have to bring their case in a timely fashion, of course. Um, but uh, they, they do this in order to in order to enforce their rights. Now, um, the employer is almost certainly always going to have more legal resources. They're going to be able to hire a law firm, right? Um, and they'll be more they'll be more easily able to withstand the legal fight, right? There's not going to be there's going to be a variety of people involved a lot of the time, and and so it's not going to the burden is not going to fall on any one person quite as much in the organization, right? Whereas when an employee, a, a wronged disabled worker, brings a case before a tribunal, um, the burden will fall upon them, 
right? And and sometimes in the most traumatizing ways. So when this happens, when it, when an when an employer when an employee brings a case, um, the employer is often going to deny that there was any disability to begin with, and there and and this this comes back to whether or not the 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 employee has disclosed their disability at the very beginning. Um, so, but even if the employee did disclose their disability, the employer is often going to deny that, that they ever disclosed in the first place. So that they're going to force the, the disabled worker essentially to, to go through the runaround of producing private medical records, of enduring perhaps embarrassing questions on the stand about private matters, about, about their disability, um, which, which turns it into an overall fairly traumatic experience for, for the disabled worker, um, which is why often um, they are told that they should just settle rather than go through the whole process. Now, so, so, so as I said, solicitors usually advise to settle to produce a rapid resolution. Um, but that's how, that has its own problems as well, right? Because if you settle before hearing all the evidence, this possibly limits the monetary award, uh, depending on the evidence presented already. It has a it limits the impact on case law because um, the Equality Act, the way it works, is that it's continually built, but precedent is is set by by further cases. But settling limits the 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 ability to to have any impact on case law. And very often, our interviewees told us as well, um, most of the time, non-disclosure agreements are going to accompany settlements also, which will further limit the publicity. It, it prevents the uh, disabled worker from talking about the case. Um, it really prevents further accountability um, from being from being being brought forward. So, so settlement a settlement might make the experience less unpleasant for the disabled worker, but it also has these limitations. Okay. Um, so, so as we can see, there is quite a bit of um, expertise needed here, and that's why um, you know it's, it sometimes might be a bit of a struggle for union officials to to have all that expertise present. So, we're going to talk a little bit about disability and COVID nineteen now, and then finally after that, we'll move into a little bit about what we should do before we um, before we conclude the presentation. The we we asked our interviewees about what. The situation has been with COVID-19. What what is the um, what is the reality now like for disabled workers? And what we found was that there's a bit of a mixed picture. Pick picture. Um, there are some benefits. There's also some costs, and, and there's still uncertainty about what it means for um, for for the future of work. Now, the perhaps most obvious benefit is that disabled workers who previously were always told that they had to work in person, um, that they that they had to be at the workplace. Um, now had the benefit of remote, flexible working, right? And so this made life a little bit easier. They didn't necessarily have to take sick leave. Um, it, uh, it, it, was, it was a more accommodating way of working. But at the same time, um, masks and social distancing and, and the fact that we had to really make sure that we didn't come in close contact with people meant that reasonable adjustments were still difficult to obtain. And if it meant that reasonable adjustments had to be brought to somebody's, somebody's place of living where they were working, um, then, it might be difficult to do that because of the elements of, of social distancing. Okay, so and disabled workers who who were not able to work right of course remotely um, who had to come into the office were at a disproportionate risk for getting COVID nineteen. Um, so for those in precarious work, and as we we found out that there was often an intersectional uh, intersectional element here as well. So black workers, black workers who were disabled as well, um, were at higher risk. And um, so the, these are these are some of the, uh, the the very notable downsides of of the pandemic for disabled workers. But beyond that, um, we also heard some evidence that redundancies had increased, and that that sometimes disabled workers were the first ones to be made redundant, um, and that in many instances they were aware of this. So this instilled a new fear of dismissal in which once again workers maybe feared revealing their disabilities or requesting reasonable adjustments. Um, and so then that leads to the performance issues which lead to the cycle of managing out as we've already kind of gone through. Now, um, while there is some fear with regard to declaring disabilities, uh, we also know from the, from the interviews that um, there's been a big increase in discrimination claims. Right, and um, and there have been new, many new tribunal cases, and as uh, Sir Sarvajaya told me just today, as a matter of fact, it seems that um, COVID nineteen is now um, being it, it, it's it's now going to 
provide the grounds for workers to, um, to bring discrimination claims more easily who have been discriminated against for disabled workers, okay? So all that said, um, COVID has forced a, a broader rethink on work as, as we all know, right? We've all had these, these questions about what does it mean to work from home versus working at the office? Um, but disabled workers had been grappling with these questions for a long time. And many of them had been arguing that well, we should be able to work from home. Um, so there's a little bit of vindication in, in, in some regard for them, but at the same time, there are these other problems as well. But we don't know um, what the full impact on disabled workers will be in the longer run. So that, that has really yet to be seen. Okay, I'm gonna hand back to um, Sarah Bajaya now to talk a little bit about what we should do. Sarbajaya, you're on mute, I believe. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, so thank you, Colin. What we should do is we've come up with a number of recommendations, 12 recommendations, in fact, and uh, to um, sort of um, see them, you'll, you'll need to, to read the report, I think. But what we wanted to do is just highlight uh, two or three that we think are really quite critical. Um, the first is, as you won't be surprised, I talked about earlier, is for employers to develop inclusive, accessible and dis disability positive cultures. Um, and as part of that, if they're going to continue focusing on reasonable adjustments rather than um, workplace adjustments, that they centralise the requests and budgets for reasonable adjustments. The um, second uh, set of recommendations um, are for government. And one of the things that we would like to, to echo, which has actually come up in previous studies um, as recommendations too, is a one-stop advice shop, really. This should be funded by government and managed by experts, both, both by um, experience and knowledge so this should be for both disabled workers and also employers and the third um set if you like of of recommendations is about legal advice and that we feel that funding should be provided for legal recognition for disabled workers and disabled workers should also be present on employment tribunal panels to ensure greater panel diversity. We understand from research and from our respondents that this was the case previously, and um, we think it could be um, for the full, full list. Uh, Colin, next steps. Yeah, thank you. Um, right. Would you like to talk about the real world stuff, Colin, and then you go on to the next bit? Yes, that sounds fine. Okay, so the real world. <laughs> um, I wanted to tell you about an organisation which is a new DDPO uh, that I'm setting up called Impatience Wellbeing, and its focus is very much going to be on implementing some of the recommendations in our report. So we want to work with employers to create disability positive cultures. We want to actually tackle the issue of um, HR uh, not being as well informed, perhaps as they, they could, on the Equality Act and reasonable adjustments and work with the uh, CIPD, the professional body, to ensure that that's part of um, what they uh, offer. Uh, we would like to also campaign for a one-stop shop and also for employment tribunal panels to be um, uh, more diverse. And we also uh, would like to work with the legal profession, um, certainly in relation to training on the Equality Act and reasonable adjustments. Again, this was something that came from our respondents, our legal respondents, um, many of whom were from all parts of the, uh, uh, the, the legal representative sector, from solicitors, barristers, and the judiciary. Um, and that seemed to be a, a, a kind of lack that that could be um, uh, plugged with some uh, more support. Um, so that's the, the real world stuff. Over to you, Colin, for the academic world. <laughs> 
Thank you, Sarah Bajai. I'm just gonna, sorry, I don't know if it appears like this for you every time. Um, yeah, so Sarah Bajai said this was the, these were the real world steps. And then we also plan to write up some papers for academic journals as well, because we, we have a, a wealth of, of really valuable data here from the interview evidence we had. And I think the, one of the overwhelming topics that comes through, through our data is, is what, what goes on in an organization's culture. Um, and, and especially how it affects workplace relations uh, between line managers, employers, and disabled workers. And um, so how, how, do, how do employers understand disability and their, their duty under the Equality Act? And uh, what are the things that affect this as well, such as uh, business model uh, or the size of the business um, or the sort of training maybe they've had or whether it's a unionized workplace? So, so there's an interesting, um, we think there's some some findings to be written up there as we as we've talked about today. We talked a little bit about the disability competence scheme, and um, the so th this would be something that we're we're curious as to how this program can can be, be can be strengthened um, because right now it um, it's it's a voluntary program and it enables companies to try to to improve their performance. Um, but it also has the danger of, of kind of uh, reputation washing a little bit with respect to disability. And so um, we, we, this is something we want to study and um, we would be particularly interested, I think, in a comparative study that maybe evaluates other um, voluntary disability programs. And then finally, the employment tribunal system. There's a lot of great socio-legal research going back to Mark Galanter um, in his article, 1974 article, Why the Haves Come Out Ahead. And I think that um, what you see in employment tribunals um, in the UK under the Equality Act often is, is the case of, of why, the, why the haves come out ahead. The organizations are better resourced. Um, it's easier to go after disabled workers. And it um, provides an experience that um, is, is probably not ideal for, uh, for, for for enforcing their judicial rights. So this is something we want to explore in academic work as well. Um, I am going to wrap up. And just to say that the, the report itself is going to be emailed to the registered participants. Um, we're in the process of getting it up online. And that will be happening very soon. And just to also ask you to please listen to our podcast on UCL's Uncovering Politics, um, which was recently recorded. And you can find um, uncovering politics on all major podcast providers. But if you also follow UCL SPP um, on Twitter, you'll, you'll see it advertised there as well. Um, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm going to stop sharing now and hand over to uh, Tony Wilson. Great. Um, thank you, Colin. And Sarah Bajaya, thank you so much for, for inviting me today. Um, forgive me, I have some background noise here. I'm just going to turn off my fan. Um, I'm going to speak for about 10 minutes. I'm now racing against the clock for, for how long it takes for, for this room to heat up to a level where I can no longer speak. So I, will, um, so I will aim to keep it to 10 minutes or less, and that will allow time for some discussion too. I've been really enjoying reading the chats and the comments too. Um, I just wanted to make my comments in um, in three areas. The first around the, the context that we're in, particularly the labour market context. The second then about the challenges as they're set out in the report. And then the third about where we might go from here. And I'd, I'd like to start just by just by um, thanking Sarah Rajar and, 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 um, and Colin for, for producing this report. I, I, I had the opportunity to read it um, uh, a week or so ago, and, uh, and I think it's excellent and it brings together range of really useful insights from the literature and new findings from speaking to people with lived experience and people who work in um in the sector and um and who work in you know supporting employers and our employers um and so i think it's hugely helpful addition to the debate and there's very and really there's nothing in here that i wouldn't agree with um uh, and that i don't think will help to 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 to, to um help us to to start to improve um uh, uh, to, to make the labour market a better place and to make work more inclusive and make work better. I should also say it's great to see a number of familiar names, if not faces, on the invitation, on, on the cast list today. And I think many of you are much more expert than me on, on some of these challenges, the opportunities and what we can do about this. Um, so enough of that. On the context, I suppose I, uh, one overarching point I would make is that 
the crises that we're facing now in the labour market are not the ones that we had prepared for, um, but they're the ones that we need to deal with. So you know, two years ago, we were anticipating an unemployment crisis. We were all expecting an unemployment crisis, the likes of which we would not have seen since the 1980s, with 4 million people unemployed, uh, likely to be unemployed on the official forecasts published in July 2020. And, and by now, we would be grappling with likely record high long term unemployment and widening gaps, disadvantages for people who are further from work and outside the labour force. In practice, we're seeing instead all, all the coverage is about a recruitment crisis, more jobs than workers, a tight labour market, holding back growth, fueling inflation and employers, business, government struggling to, to know what to do with it, what levers to pull. Um, but I would say you know, clearly this is being driven by a number of factors, um, the, the, the large shocks to the economy from closing down, opening up, uh, closing down and opening up again. Um, really significant changes in the work that we do, which um, which which uh, which which Colin and Sarah have set out already about where we work, what sorts of work and how we work. But most importantly, and, and the reason I mention this really is because we've seen an almost unprecedented fall in labour force participation, a million fewer people in the labour force than on pre-pandemic trends. And that being driven by older people leaving the labour force in near record numbers across um, across job types, across occupation groups, across incomes. Um, younger people joining the labour force later, uh, fewer migrants, fewer migrant workers, and really importantly, now the largest number of people out of work due to long term ill health that we've had in two decades, um, 2.4 million people out of work due to a long term health condition. And this, you know, long term ill health often gets conflated with disability, and, and clearly these are these are these are related but different concepts. There's been a lot of speculation about what could be driving this, about long COVID as a driver, which must surely be one factor. But I think probably as important or more important is a combination of people waiting for treatment, people with long long term conditions, including many disabled people, being more likely to have been furloughed, more likely to have left work and finding it harder to get back into work, exactly the issues that have been talked about in this report. Um, and that persisting due to the health risks of, 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 of workplaces still even now, um, but, but particularly now because of uh, the removal of restrictions in nearly almost all workplaces, um, and by employer attitudes, employer attitudes around the need for support and around risk right now, and the needs for adjustments. And, and the, the, the bureaucratic and the difficult and the, and the dysfunctional system we currently have for making adjustments at the point where people enter work it's slightly, slightly better for making adjustments where people acquire an impairment or a disability while in work. But I'm sure that these, these challenges around how, how the adjustment process work is also holding back many disabled people now. And while I think there's fairly limited evidence so far, there's anecdotal evidence, which we've talked about. There is, you know, and anecdotal evidence is really important um, around disabled people being affected in different ways and being affected disproportionately by the pandemic. There's fairly limited evidence overall that employment gaps have widened. Nonetheless, uh, disabled people were by far and away the most disadvantaged of the groups covered by the Equality Act before the pandemic, most disadvantaged in the labour market, with, with people being two and, disabled people being two and a half more time, times more likely to be out of work than non-disabled people, an employment gap equivalent to 2.6 million more people out of work, and, and halving the gap, you know, the government's ambition, the 1.3 million additional from now, um, additional um, uh, further disabled people in work feels like an ambition that is well well out of our reach uh, where, from where we stand now. And I want to start in that context because I do think it frames all of our discussions on what's happening and what we can do in the future. But in particular, because I think disability and employment support for disabled people has been overlooked and neglected in public policy and by employers um, for far too long. Um, and I think actually among, amidst all the pessimism um, and the concern, which I think is justified uh, around this, I do also think this is a moment where we can potentially look forward with some optimism because the social and economic imperative for change that, 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 you have, that many of you have been making for decades and that we ourselves have, have tried to contribute to and advocate for is now becoming a much clearer business imperative too. Having a diverse workforce, changing how we work to accommodate people um, uh, to accommodate you know, everybody who wants to work and, and feels able to work is an opportunity now for businesses. It's not a problem to be managed um, or indeed a problem to be managed out, which, um, you know, which is where this report um, you know, clearly started from, you know, the, 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 um, how, how disabled people are often managed out of work. So just moving on to the report, I mean, this is why I sort of welcome this work, because I think there is 
for all of the issues raised, there's an underlying optimism here that we can change things. And I think I'd limit my remarks really to three areas. The first is the point, and reiterating points that have been made. The first is the point around culture change. The second around how we equip and support employers. Uh, inevitably, I've, you know, forgive me, I've tended to focus mainly on employers and sort of public policy drivers here. Um, and thirdly, uh, how we enforce this. And on culture change, when you have the opportunity to read the report, I think this sets this out really clearly. Uh, the good practices as well as too often the bad. And I think the biggest challenge we face here is that there's far too little of the former and too much of the latter. We are seeing more appetite, more interest, uh, more focus and engagement from employers, but it's clearly not enough. And I think this starts at senior leadership levels, really importantly. I think actually the government's disability, um, not necessarily disability strategy, but some of their earlier white papers, uh, green papers diagnose some of these issues relatively well. They're short on solutions, but set out how, how we need to drive wider culture change um, across organizations and across society. But critically, we must focus on how we can build capability within HR. And then from that, how we can address what we often observe at IES as a, as a, as a rhetoric reality gap between HR policies and often board level ambitions and what and what line managers actually do. And this kind of squeeze middle of line managers is often unintentional uh, uh, lack of capability or lack of skill, but it can also reflect biases and it can also reflect um, a, you know, a, a lack of understanding about how, how to make adjustments, how to support people, how to, how to be a supportive employer. And again, this is set out really well in the report. The second area then around what employers do and how we can better work with or support employers, the important distinction is made, which is talked about in the discussion too, um, about this distinction between how it's framed in the report between kind of reasonable adjustments and workplace adjustments. Now, how we can move to an approach which is more about trying to make work more flexible by default rather than simply or only, I think we must, we need to do both, but rather than only focusing on how we can make a reasonable adjustment to a given job role, it must be, I think, must be a greater focus of all of our attention in how we work with employers. We're seeing right now a, a huge momentum, a huge opportunity here in work that employers are doing around working hours, working patterns, and how they can embed um, a different ways of thinking about flexibility to accommodate people who want to work at home and at work, who have caring responsibilities, who want to work fewer hours, who have different needs. We must embed in that thinking about disability um, and about ability and how we can better support, um, how we can better design work differently and as well as support individual adjustments at work. And I think this does get to the heart of the sort of the social rather than the medical model, which I think you know, is, is, is referenced in the report and I think which we would all want to advocate for. I think that we also have to address, and this is perhaps touched on a bit less in the report, what is often a kind of toxic um, mix or nexus around sort of health management at work, um, leading into absence management, which then leads into performance management. And, and in my decade in the public sector, I saw this most clearly, but it's prevalent in other industries too. And I think it's particularly risky where employers don't um, top up sick pay or where they employ people in insecure contracts or where they're more hasty or more ready to let people go when when these issues um, when when people start to have extended periods of absence and um, and I think you know rightly the report calls out occupational health and HR as disciplines as professions and uh, and 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 I think more positively the need for us to invest in those and to try to support people who are working in those industries who, who, who are focused on how we can support, you know, um, better quality work, better workplace support, improved health management at work um, and, and greater levels of economic and social inclusion. I think that we also need to really recognise diversity of needs here and the needs to do more and to provide more support for those that need more support. Um, so my experience as a as a, as, a, as, a, as a disabled middle class senior man whose whose disability has not in any way limited my work or at least not this work I can't I wouldn't be able to join the army the police or fly an aeroplane but it's never affected my ability to to work in public policy or social research my experience is hugely different for those of other people in other sectors and so I do think part of this is about sectors and it is about socioeconomics or class it's about the types of work that people do and it's about how they're employed and it comes back to many of the many similar issues around what makes work meaningful and rewarding and secure for people around power, control, autonomy, support at work. Um, and I think this also gets to the heart of our experiences of, of, of the impacts of hybrid working post-COVID. So we have to do more 
we have to view this, I think, also as a sort of socioeconomic and class issue about how we can make work better for, for, for people in low paid, less secure work, how we, you know, how we can address some of those underlying drivers that can really undermine people's ability to stay in work. Um, final point then is around enforcement, where I would say, I think, um, you know, we do, you know, we really need to focus on, this isn't all about culture and practice. You know, we have gutted labour market enforcement over decades, particularly over the last decade. And I think, you know, the health and safety executive has a key role here in supporting management standards and supporting good health at work, not just good safety. But I but I do also, you know, I, I would I would love to see the EHRC better, play, the, the Equalities and Human Rights Commission, better place to carry out its enforcement role to, to support practice sharing and also to support compliance and take the burden off the individual and uh, and to be able to take more action at an employer level where 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 standards are not being met where rules are not being followed and I think there's two references to the HRC in the report which is not a reflection of the report it's a reflection of I think the limited extent to which it is currently um, in this space particularly on disability so look what do we do I mean I'll stop there I've gone on too long over to you all really and what we do about this um, the recommendations I think sound great actually and by coincidence uh, broadly because the version I saw didn't have the recommendations in it but uh, broadly actually where I was thinking too I mean we, we have to look at how we can change mindsets how we can build culture change how we can champion at all levels with employers industries and sectors how we have to look at how we can work better through HR and occupational health to build capability and support investment um, but I think you know and but critically I think we also have to look at how we can develop support services and this was one of the key recommendations by the sounds of it support services that are not based on products like access to work but are based on individuals and their needs and where disability expertise is embedded in employment and skills services and disability champions advisors advocates intermediaries whatever we want to call them are working across services with employers with individuals to help people out of work to find work to help employers to design jobs differently to help people in work to stay there and hardwiring this into how we work locally because so much now is is being devolved and delivered through local partnerships as well as national policy will be key but look i think it, it this is this is such a difficult this this is an area where where it feels like we've had so we we, we have been shouting in, into a void and there's been so much um uh you know so many issues and challenges we've right identified in this report for so long but i do think there's an opportunity now as well for us to try to affect change and try to influence um for, for, for better work in the future thank you Thank you so much, Tony, for uh, for taking the time for these comments. Really insightful. Thank you so much for um, for joining us today. Um, so we now reach the the Q and A um, part of our our event today. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, if you would like to ask a question, please put that into the Q and A function, uh, and then we'll be very happy to put that to the presenters or to our discussant. Um, if you are visually impaired or can otherwise not use the Q and A function, also feel feel free to use the raise hand function in Zoom. And then we can call on you and you can um, turn on your video and you can ask the language verbally or through sign language if you like. All right, so let me start with the, with the first couple of questions that we've received. First question is one for, for Dr. Kumar. Uh, for the organizations which were better at supporting with reasonable adjustments, what were some of the approaches, processes, or policies that seem to have worked well? Were there any examples from the research? Am I off mute now? You're off mute, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so to Tony said that, you know, there's cause for optimism, and there certainly is, because some of the organisations we did interview were really um, streets ahead and had very disability-inclusive cultures. Um, I talked about uh, them in, in relation to adjustments, but they... They viewed talent, and this is how they viewed us as workers, talent, as all talent. So it didn't matter, you know, they, they couldn't really answer questions about disabled workers and non-disabled workers because they said, we just don't see people like that uh, in that way. What we see is we have talent and what we see is we need to, to ensure that that talent can um, bring their best self to work or, or whatever, you know, the phrase, phrase is. Um, and all, all adjustments are for everybody. So if you're a parent or a carer and you need to do the school run or whatever it is, you can have flexible working, you can request it just as if a disabled person needs to start slightly later in the day because of medication or, you know, brain fog or whatever it is, the symptoms, that's perfectly fine too. So there, there's no, 
division, everybody could um, request adjustments. Um, and this was sort of the kind of organization I definitely as, aspire to, to, to work for. These were global organizations too. Um, so that was very interesting. Um, with those that haven't quite reached that sort of utopian idea really yet, um, where we saw positive um, uh, things in relation to reasonable adjustments was, as I mentioned in, in the presentation, that they had centralized this function so that it wasn't then down to the line manager um, to either find the budget or, you know, or even try and work out how to provide this reasonable adjustment, but this was a centralized function. And sometimes it had people uh, with lived experience working in that function um, and they had a budget. But that said, uh, the other issue is that a lot of managers think that everything costs a lot and it really doesn't. Something like 96% of reasonable adjustments are cost neutral. Um, so, uh, and, and those that cost over and above uh, a, an amount, of course, access to work is there to, to uh, fund most of uh, the adjustments that, that might cost more. Um, so I'm, I'm not, and I think I've answered the question, um, Christian, but just, just clarify if I haven't. I think I think you did. Uh, Colin or Tony, do you want to come in as well? Otherwise, we'll go to the next question. I'm, I'm happy to come in briefly just, just to say that um, I, I think in a lot of our recommendations that we put forward have to do with, with, with training and giving giving advice and giving information because another theme that just along the lines of organizational culture that they kept coming up was that um, you might have great policies and procedures on paper but if um, if there's no one there to enforce them properly or, or who doesn't believe in the cause of, of disability equality, um, then then you're going to often run into these problems with reasonable adjustments where they're not prioritized and it leads to this sort of downward spiral. And I, the, the number of times we heard of instances where somebody had a line manager who was really supportive um, and then somebody else came in to replace them and it was a totally different sort of line manager. And you really start to think, um, what is the use of these policies if it's just totally up to the um, to, to the nature of the, of the person the person who's in charge right so so that leads you to think well obviously we need to do more in terms of educating um, HR officials and line managers about how to make these things more important and so um, you know there are ways to, to I so I should also point out at this point that that um, in the chat Professor Kim Hoke has pointed out that much of what we've said um, is, is also echoed in the Dis Disability Employment Charter and in the Center for Social Justice report they put out last year. And we do cite them, um, at, we do cite them quite a bit, the, the work that they've done on this um, in the report. We, we um, failed to mention them in the PowerPoint, but in the presentation, but they, they, they talk about many of the same things along those lines. So I, that, that's, that's a very broad set of recommendations, but that's kind of the, the way um, that, that it often needs to be thought about, right? That, that you really have to have the thinking um, to, and the information to go along with the, the structures. Great, thank you so much. Next question. Um, why would employers develop inclusive, accessible, and disability positive cultures if they have not done so? In other words, what would incentivize or make them do so? Sarbajaya, do you want to take that and maybe you can tack on what you were going to say at the uh, end? Okay, the so, yes, I, I was just going to, in, just in relation to the last um, point that Colin raised, we also heard from, particularly from lawyers, that um, often organisations had very good policies, um, but they often didn't know that they had good policies. They just didn't implement them, but they didn't even know that they existed. So that was uh, a concern as well. Um, um, in terms of um, what sort of so say the question again, uh, Christian, what? Sure. So, so the question is, why would employers develop inclusive, yeah. accessible and disability positive cultures if they have not done so? So in other words, what would yeah. incentivize or make them do so? Yeah, so there, there's sort of the ethical argument, I suppose, that we, you know, we are 22 percent of the working population, disabled people, and um, we should be included in the in the workforce um, as any other. We want to work and enjoy our careers just like anybody else. 
But there is an economic argument too. I mean, uh, Professor Hopp, who's one of our advisors to, to the research, was saying that, you know, the labour market um, has shortages too. So there are sort of economic arguments. Why would they? Um, I, I guess both on the on the both of those grounds, both for sort of valuing ethical and valuing uh, everyone, um, but also there are business reasons to to include uh, excluded groups. Tony, do you do you, do you want to like, add? Um, I'm, yeah, look, I'm really happy to, happy to come in. So I think it's a, a really good question. I think there's there's a couple of dimensions. So this one is that I think many employers simply are not thinking about disability and disability inclusion in the same way that they think about inclusion for um, people who may fall under other protected characteristics in the Equality Act. One reason for that is because they're not required to report on it. And I think reporting has driven behaviour change. And that, another is because there isn't enough public focus and attention on some of these issues, which is a point made in the in the conversation as, as well. And I think it's something that we've you know, grappled with for, for, for years. I'm always tempted to ask him who knows more, much more about this disability at work work and through his work with so, Centre for Social Justice on their on their um, uh, commission last last year. But so there's a set of factors around, I think employers aren't thinking enough about it. And that actually, there's a similar story there on employment for older people and work we've done around for the Centre for Aging Better, which showed clearly that a lot of discrimination over and unintended discrimination in the labour market in employer practices was at root because they just didn't think this was a problem or something they should be focusing on. Or alternatively, they viewed it as a very specific problem rather than something that they should be trying, trying to address. So I think that's one part of it. Another is, I think, one thing that might drive action would be if we had stronger requirements, particularly, I think, where people are leaving work because, because of a failure to, for employers to meet their legal obligations around adjustments. Um, and that comes back to the enforcement, the enforcement point too. I think if we could do more to, to raise the profile of enforcement action and, and have more enforcement action, that as well could, could drive change. But I don't think I've got, I think others have have better answers than me around some of the myriad other factors that can drive this. If I, if I can just jump in quickly on that, um, Christian, as well, that, that, that one thing that came up, so, so why should employers change their, what, what, what incentive do they have? And I think, um, they, they might feel they, like they don't have an incentive to do it because they, they, as Tony said, they're not thinking about disability equality or they're, they're thinking about it through a, very, through a very narrow lens, right? So we heard repeatedly that a lot of employers, when, when told about somebody with a disability, immediately start thinking of, oh, we need to, we need to build a ramp um, or we have to have a, a, a lift put in or, or you know, whatever the most expensive modification to the building they can possibly think of is what has to be done. When the reality is that that's, what's has, that's what has to be done in, in a very small minority, a, a very small number of the times, right? Most of the time, it's something far simpler than that. Um, and it's a question of like, what is, what is the barrier, right? So I suppose we also didn't do, we, we kind of hinted at it, we, 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 we talked about it, but like there's, there's a lot of you in the audience will already know about the social model versus the medical model. And the medical model is about treating the disabled worker, whereas, whereas most, most people here agree that, that the social model, figuring out how you remove the barrier, you sit down with an open mind and you have more imagination about how do you, um, how do you remove this, this particular barrier in question. Right. And, and so it's, you know, a lot of it is just how you change the thinking. Right. And so I think it's not, you know, you might still have pressures against um, accommodating disab disabled workers like the business model, like precarious work, um, like other things that they might push against. But at the same time, I, I think that the, the research points that there's a lot of reason to be optimism, to be to be optimistic if you can change the thinking. Um, to kind of get away from this thinking about it's it's just about you know building a ramp um, or it's it's going to be horribly expensive because much of the time that's not true either um, and and you do I don't think we've mentioned it but there was a great statistic uh, about well just just that a lot of um, people and employers often think of disabled people as being less productive or not being able to do quite as much I don't Sarah Bajaya might remember the precise statistic but it's kind of it's quite alarming 
right? And, and it's probably linked up to these things as well, the idea that, that uh, it's not worth the cost um, or something, something to that effect. So um, I just wanted to add that in there as well. Thanks so much. And then we have a, a related comment. Um, um, and so you can, if you, if you want to, you can expand on that as well, which is, uh, I applaud all the actions and ideas proposed, but I don't see strategic direction that will persuade a minister or employer. I'm looking for much stronger disability leadership that can influence public thinking, and so the political and employer groups. It's a comment more than a question, but I was wondering if anybody would like to, to pick up on the comment and, and reflect on, on how to generate that, that public disability leadership. Do you want to take that, Sarbajai, or do you want to? Yeah. I'm reflecting on it. <laughs> you go ahead. Well, I it, it's a fair point, and it's something it, it's something that we did think about a little bit, and it's something that um, yeah, it, it it it's a fair point because the what we're talking about is not um, it, is not an easy thing, right? When you're talking about how to change change the thinking of employers, so that's why we. We we decided to adopt um, proposals like having one stop one stop shop you know sort of place where you can take a lot of the great evidence that's already out there as we pointed out there's a lot of great organizations that are that are putting this evidence out there um, and you can make it more readily available I think the challenge is like how to kind of get employers to look for it and and how they can they can do that um, but yeah that's something that that I that I admit I think we probably needed to work on a little bit more. Um, and figuring out, and, and there are there are other sources out there, like the, um, the the report put out for the for the um, the Council for Social Justice, um, where they have some more specific recommendations on that. But in um, in this case, we we're just trying to figure out some basic ways in which um, employers can be provided with more information. Um, Sarah Bajai, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No, I think it's a, a valid point, and and as you say, Colin, maybe we can reflect a bit more on it. Um, I, I do think leadership is essential. I mean, it's certainly in those disability positive, inclusive organisations, leadership was critical. Um, but also the other important um, aspect that we came across was employee resource groups, you know, so disabled worker groups, or, you know, all affinity groups, they were very um, strong and, and instrumental in linking with their leadership, whether it was at the governance level or the senior leadership level, and, and had routes to um, conversations about changing their organisations. So, yeah, I think um, that's, a, that's a very important aspect as well, uh, is the employee resource groups. Um, and, and yeah, the, the other thing that came up quite a lot was or, or a number of examples were very uh, large global organizations who have actually um, either leaders who have uh, personal experience of disability, so they may have a relative, a child or something, which has made them think about it, um, or not, not so often um, people who di disclose that they are disabled and they're in the leadership uh, role. Um, but it's yeah, it's an important point. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I was, I was also loath to try to answer this because I agree. I agree with the statement. I think um, uh, it was good to see Kim has made a comment in the chat about the minister for disabled people, Chloe Smith. I, I I've been quite impressed with how she has how how she has uh, how uh, how she's promoting this and, and 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 focusing on this and focusing in particular employment. But I think it's a relatively underpowered brief, and I think. There's a really important point about yeah i don't think the answer is ministers and you know task forces necessarily but i think that role needs more status and needs more power across governments um, and needs to be able to push for that 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 charter and the principles that are charter with more force on the employer side they've actually we're hoping to start some work on this i hope in the next month or two because i think actually you know we are hearing a lot from employers about what can we do to support participation to address um, higher rates of worklessness amongst older people, people with health conditions and so on. So I hope we'll have some work out on this because I think business leadership is really key on this too. There are, you know, the Business Disability Forum, it's worked by business in the community, there's others too, but I think how we 
get again give that more status more teeth more exposure to other employers is really important and it needs to be underpinned by reforms to disability confident which are talked about in this report too um disability confident could be a great force for change if people believe it's credible and believe there'll be benefits to them of signing up to it and doing and in particular signing up at level two and level three Thank you so much. Um, then we have a factual question, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to, to you to decide who, who, who wants to respond to it. How many disabled people have taken employers to tribunal? Do we know that? I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I, do, I don't, I, I would have to go and find that, um, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the precise number. Um, what I do know from from the evidence we had is that it's not seen as a it's not generally recommended, um, but we do know it's not generally recommended because of all the reasons that we talked about in the report, but there do there, there does appear to be a, an upswing um, in the numbers of discrimination cases or, or discrimination claims being brought partly because of COVID. Um, and so that's that's going to have an impact and we might we might see see more cases, um, but there's already a, a bit of a backlog going on now as well so it's it's not going to lead to speedy justice necessarily um but uh no unfortunately i don't have a precise answer to that question of, of, of what the what the numbers are that i understand there was a drop off in um going to tribunal after the legal aid uh reforms in 2012 so a lot of people who would have not exactly liked because that's not the language but needed perhaps to go to tribunal couldn't afford to do so and that at one stage there was um uh, a payment that was required in order to you know in the at the first stage that that's been removed now but that did cause a lot of uh problems for low paid disabled people steve hall says in the chat that he thinks there's about seven thousand disability discrimination claims in the tribunal per year um but, but there's also gonna be other types of claims brought. So thank you for that, Steve. Thank you. Um, and we've, uh, speaking of that, we've had an incredibly active uh, chat. So let me just pick one last question uh, from the chat, which is probably slightly polemic, but then still a good note to end. Is chair adjustment NB not just a complete failure of the organization to educate all staff on the provisions of the Equality Act? I missed the beginning of that, Christian. I'm sorry. Could you repeat? Yeah, that? sure. So it, the question is: Is chair adjustment envy not just a complete failure of the organisation to educate all staff on the provisions of the Equality Act? Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. And uh, you know, I was thinking about this um, chair envy business. I mean, I, you know, when I was in uh, my last organisation. I actually had to have a chair, a specific chair for my musculoskeletal condition. And um, I didn't, I wasn't, uh, uh, that chair envy wasn't part of my um, experience. But what was interesting was that the specialist ergonomic chair was much cheaper than um, the standard chair. So, um, you know, but, but yes, absolutely, it is, it is a failure. And also, you know, a lot of the comments that we heard that line managers say um, about oh well this will impact the team you know we can't explain this to the team um, you know the team won't like it other people won't like it I, I'm not sure whether this was their own kind of anxiety or this was a, a, just a perception or, or how much was it reality um, and but yet it's very important because it permeates the decisions that are made so uh, yes, I, I would. And absolutely. And employers who, who raise concerns about this, their, their reason will often be because the chairs for everybody else are rubbish or because we're not prepared to give other people flexibility around their shift patterns or more notice on when they'll be required to work or greater control and autonomy in their work. And I think this is a really, it, is, it gets to an important point, which is there are things that should be workplace adjustments, which make work, I think, better and more accessible and more rewarding and enjoyable for all of us. Um, and then there are things which are 
required adjustments that enable disabled people to participate in the labour force on the same basis as people who don't have those impairments or non-disabled people. So, so there's a distinction there. I think we should be trying to raise the bar for making work better across the piece and making sure it's inclusive and can support participation for, for everyone who wants to um, who wants to work. I just add to that, you know, I was writing a report with one of my, well, all of my fabulous support workers, but one of them is Anya and she's German. And she was telling me that her friend works in, in a German company and they give them all uh, ergonomic chairs because back pain is a massive cause of sickness. Um, and it, it makes business sense, actually, to, to, to do what Tony's just said, you know, making it uh, better for everyone, but also uh, adding the specific adjustments. So yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we've reached the end of today's event. Uh, also on behalf of the Association for Disabled Professionals, the UCL Policy Lab and the UCL School of Public Policy. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks a million to the two presenters for taking the time to present us today. Thank you so much, Tony, for taking the time for the discussion comments. Um, and thank you so much overall for what was a wonderful event, also with a very active chat, um, which was great and enriched a lot of the a lot of the discussion. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Thanks.